All right. So hello everyone. I'm Shringi and uh, I'm a lecturer of game design at UEL. Uh, in terms of uh, my background, I have been working in the industry for about 13 years and uh, I worked in big companies like EA and Zynga and some small companies like Google, etc. And I've published quite a few titles, some, some good and some not so great. Um, so yeah, I, I think one of the more popular titles that you would have heard about is, uh, is Worms. So I worked on Worms Reloaded on the mobile version. And um, lately I finished my PhD in applying stage magic to games, you know, principles and tools. And that is what we'll talk about uh, today a bit, uh, about magic and game design. Um, so if you have any questions or if you want to, you know, uh, give your input, you're very welcome. So with that, I'm going to start the session. I hope everybody can see my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Brilliant, thank you. So we're going to talk about why game designers should study stage magic. And when, I'm, when I say stage magic, I mean the close-up magic or the magic that happens on stages as, as performance. Um, and I've been working on this piece of why we should study magic for the last four years. So there's quite a bit of uh, uh, interest that I have in both the fields. So one of the main questions is basically, why should we do that? Like, wh why magic, right? So at the end of it, game designers and magicians, we're both building illusions. So we're building illusions in which the rules that we are telling the participants are the rules that hold. However, this illusion has limits to it, but while the participant or uh, the players are in that illusion, we want them to feel like we're not uh, breaking the laws of that world. And this is why fundamentally magic and uh, and games have this commonality, but it's not just magic, right? It's also movies and literature. However, what magic does is also interaction. You know, when a magician goes like, pick a card, any card, and then uh, the participant does it, while it might be all scripted, in that moment for the participant, there is a real choice, right? So we're going to uh, look at magic from this perspective of how magicians choreograph the surprise and this illusion of choice and what we can learn as game designers. So I'm going to start with a, with sharing a magic trick with all of you. Are you ready? I hope so. So I'm going to start this. Okay, Khadija is typing, so I'll wait for Khadija. <laughs> Brilliant. So, um, wait, I'm not sure if you can hear the audio, so let me just check that setting real quick. Okay, let's start from the beginning.
Blossom. So, <laughs> do you know how that happened? Any ideas? Surface tension. Any any other ideas? All right. So it is actually just uh, an animation, just a CGI, um, and there is no real physics involved in this. However. Uh, the magic trick is set up in a way that you you start thinking how did that happen and it starts questioning your understanding of uh, physics and it happens to everybody right uh, because the way it is set up what the magician is saying is that there's a causal relation between what they're doing and what is happening so there's a causal relation between you twisting the cup and the water starting to spin and the magician does it a few times to show that if the cup will spin, uh, sorry, if you spin the cup fast enough, the water will start spinning. And we start thinking that, okay, if, uh, if, if A follows B, then B must be the cause of A. That's how our human mind thinks. Like once we put a causal relation between uh, our actions and our output, we start making that connection, right? So uh, like you said, surface tension, we ended up just the magician using CGI, right? Uh, and why the CGI works in this case is not just the causal relation of you twisting the cup and uh, the water spinning, but also uh, because if you look at the setup, it looks very authentic, right? In that world, you, you this person has a shaky camera and the, the tables are set up in a way that you can't really, uh, you don't really think that this person has the uh, technical know-how to really uh, make an animation uh, or a CGI work like that, right? So how do we apply that to games? Uh, any ideas? How can that be applied to games? So like there is this game uh, called Katamari Damashi and in, in Katamari Damashi, uh, if you're aware of it, what happens is that you are sent on planet Earth to collect objects on your tiny adhesive ball to create stars, which is quite an outlandish concept. And now what the game designers have to do, have to make this interaction sound valid in the game world and do that pretty quick, right? Uh, players should start thinking that, okay, in this world, this is how it works and that's fine. So what this game does is that it has this ball and the causal interaction is if the ball touches a smaller object, it attaches to the ball. If it if it touches a bigger object, it does not attach, right? So uh, an easier thing to grasp is, for example, if I switch on the lights in this uh, room and a fire starts, right? I'll be like, uh, that was not me. If I switch it on again and the fire starts, I'm like, what is happening? If I do it two or three times and every time my switching on the lights is starting a fire, I start to think that maybe there's something that I'm doing which is short circuiting something and it is starting the fire. So we start putting this causal relation. This can be put in advantage in games, in setting up interactions, right? During your tutorial or during anything that if a player does this and every time the output is something, then they'll start thinking that is the law of the world. That is how we are almost hardwired. We can. What happens if we don't set the causal relation? That is the more important part, right? Uh, because most designers knowingly or unknowingly, we are setting up causal re relations. But what happens if, if we don't set up those relations? So for example, this is one of my favorite games. It's called Badland and it's a platformer. And you're going from, uh, you're a clone and you're going from one end of the platform to another. And now when, when first time when I was playing the game, something happened and I, I died in the game. And I didn't know what happened, right? I didn't know whether it is because I collided with the gears or whether I collided with the uh, walls. 
I don't know what is happening. So what has happened is the causal relation has broken because A could have collided with B and could have died. A could have, could have collided with C and could have died. And the player is a bit confused. This is a small game, so it gets solved quite quickly. And it's it's got beautiful art, so it gives you reason to uh, to continue. But imagine a bigger world and adding these kind of conflating causal causal relations. It makes it a bit confusing, right? Uh, so, for example, I am switching on the fan or switching on the lights, and also sipping. Uh, water and the fire starts and that happens again and again so i don't know if it's the sip, sipping of the fire uh, sipping of the water or switching of the lights which is doing it so i'll not think that it is because of me because now there is like too many interactions which are colliding right so this is how we can use very simple causal interactions so if i were to ask you to design one of these interaction reactions how would you go about it so one of the simple ways of doing this interaction reaction is to think really small, right? Think of player does this, what happens, right? So players, player touches a fish, the fish's head becomes big. Now this is an outlandish interaction in the real world, but if that happens over and over in a game, what is the interaction and reaction? Interaction is player touches the fish and the reaction is the fish's head becomes big. And now in your game world, you can almost never really contradict that. You can uh, you can add information to it. You can play with expectations. But once you've set the causal relations, a lot more can happen and we'll see what can happen. OK, so are we ready for <laughs> another magic trick? I'm just going to assume that we are ready for another magic trick, right? OK. like a, a famous magician and what he's doing here is that he said the causal relations first like if you do a then b happens if you go from the if you take the put your water in the tank you can get a coin out and that relation is set now we are thinking how did you do it is it in the sleeves what is happening and then once that causal relation is set now he can break expectations add surprise so he's adding new variables now, like you can get it from the air, you can get it from the shirt, you can get it from the specs. And as a player or as a, as a viewer, we are trying to solve the problem. And he as a designer or as a magician is one step ahead of uh, playing with that causal relation. So we'll see an example real quick of how games have done it. So uh, Limbo is a game, is a platform game 
where this tiny little person is going to find uh, their sister. And what we see on the screen is a bear trap. And the first time you interact with the bear trap, you realize that uh, the moment the character is going to touch the trap, it's going to go close and the, and the character is going to burst and die. So a causal relationship is set that interact with the uh, bear trap and the player would die. Now, later in the game, you know how the bear trap works, but the reasoning of uh, the puzzle design changes the context completely. So later in the game, there's a rope that is uh, coming down and you have to put the bear trap in a place in a way that when it touches the rope, it will do this and then it will create weight and uh, the next contraption will start working. So what, what happens here is that the nature of the bear trap doesn't change, but the equation, just like Teller, he's not changing the nature of coins going into the jar, but the equation is changing. And at the end of it, there is the fishes, which what I call is the boss fight or the big reveal. So you play with interactions, you play with your causal relations, but it is important that the player gets something which is unexpected or something bigger, right? So you're playing with your little uh, interactions and then there's a boss fight or there is some kind of reward and stuff. So it changes your equation and allows you to add new equations to your game. Now I know this is not super straightforward. It's something to think about, right? It's just something to think about and start thinking how that can be applied in games. Uh, like we said, the example with player touches the fish and the fish head bloats or becomes bigger. Can you think of how the, those interactions can be broken? or the expectations can be broken using this whole thing that we just saw with breaking of expectations and creating surprise. Or if you have any other questions related to this. Any ideas? So one of the ways would be, you know, you have the player interacts with fish and the fish head becomes big. And another could be that uh, something else like a plant or a cacti interacts with the fish and the fish head goes big, right? So we are conflating information, but new information is coming. And you're like, what just happened? How did that happen? So now the player is going about looking for cacti to see what this new interaction is. So this is how you work with one interaction and just keep adding surprise to it. This is, this is what I call the choreography of surprise. The other thing that magicians do really well is create an illusion of choice. So, you know, doing things like pick a card, any card, and it is either all scripted or no matter what you do, you're going to get the same answer. So let's try it. Uh, let's try it a bit. Let me change my background effect. Okay. So you can you, let's see. It's a bit hard to be done virtually, but we'll give it a shot, okay? volunteer please anybody interested in the small oh great uh, do you mind unmuting your mic please Ethan uh, sure hello hello hi <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna ask you to do something I'm not a great magician so please don't expect amazing things uh, so uh, could you please gently, very gently, uh, in your mind, uh, very gently just touch, just touch two of these uh, objects, okay? Okay. Which one are those? Which one did you gently touch? Uh, depends. Uh, they're all. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the orange pen with the, the white uh, clicker part. 
at the front closest to the camera. This one is it? Oh, this one. Okay. Yeah. And? And uh, the uh, paintbrush at the back, uh, blue handle. This one? Yeah. Okay. So, we will. Okay, now can you uh, really gently touch one of them? Okay. Which one? The pens. Okay. So you are left with this. Does somebody else want to volunteer? Okay, we'll do it with you one more time. Okay? Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what's happening after that. <laughs> um, so let's let's move it around a bit. So can you see all four of them? Yeah. Okay. In your mind, uh, can you please gently touch uh, two of these objects? Very gently. You gotta be gentle. You can't topple them over. And what are those objects? The paint brushes and the water thingy on the on the right. Uh, can you do that once again for me, please? Uh, just very gently touch the touch one of them. Very very gently. The water thingy. Okay, so you, you get this. So do you see what I did? Yeah. So you kept you. I ended up with the the option that I wasn't selecting in a sense. I ended up with the other uh, thing with the, the paintbrushes instead of the water yeah. bottle. Yeah. So no matter what you would have chosen, you would have gotten the paintbrushes, right? Yeah. And right now we are in a lecture of magic, so you know what's happening. But if it is more like done not virtually, you can. Uh, uh, the, what the magician would do that is in the beginning, they will predict. They'll be like, oh, you're going to get the paintbrushes. And then no matter what you do, it'll just be done once and you'll get the paintbrushes and then that'll be the surprise. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So that's called uh, a forcing. A forcing basically means that you are uh, giving the illusion of free choice, but there isn't really uh, a free choice over there. Uh, Magicians do this a lot. So there is a script and you have like pick a card, any card or these kind of illusions. And then uh, the players pick what they uh, uh, the players pick what they think they're picking and the magicians give what they think uh, they're giving. Right. So let's see some types of uh, this kind of illusion and what we have found in games. So. There's something called identical choice. So an identical choice, what is happening is no matter what you choose, uh, the you'll get the same answer like we did last time. But no matter like what you see is being given to you as a different choice, it's actually the same choice. So for example, what a magician would do is bring a pack of cards, okay? And they're like 52 cards. And they'll say, pick a card, any card. And then you'll pick a card and they'll be like, oh, that's the four of clubs. And they'll like, you'll be like, yeah, that's four of clubs. How do you know? And the way you know it is that uh, the way magician knows it is because all of those cards were actually four of clubs. Do you get that? Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's basically a trick, trick pack, right? Everything behind every card is four of clubs. But as a participant, you don't expect that uh, because you're not expecting to be deceived. As human beings, we think that we are in the con in control of our choices. So we don't really think that we are actually being deceived. So we give in to that illusion. Uh, one of the ways that games have used it is that uh, there's one game called High Octane where you have different cars uh, and the car and uh, the game asks you to make a choice. And no matter which car you choose, you'll get the same stats, but you'll be made to believe that it's different stats. And uh, in this particular game, they did that because they ran out of time in production. And after a while, they were like, uh, what do you call it? Players were like, oh, which car did you choose? And mine did this and yours did that and played into the illusion. The psychological principle behind one of this is called uh, choice blindness. 
right? Choice blindness is that once you assign your choice to something, you want to believe that you were the one who made that choice. So once you've made the choice, you will justify the choice. So there was a study where, uh, you know, participants were given a lot of cards and each one of them had somebody's picture on it. You could see all the pictures. And then uh, participants were asked that uh, pick one of these cards. And now no matter like it was sleight of hand. So no matter what the participants put their fingers on, uh, the magician would do a sleight of hand and give them one of those pictures, right? Uh, so say I put a put a put my finger on a on my face, not on my face. Let's just say on uh, Donald Trump's face. But no matter what I do, I'll get uh, some. I haven't seen your face, but Ethan's face, right? And now they were asked, why did you choose Ethan's face? And instead of the participants saying, no, 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 I chose Donald Trump's face, you, uh, the participants go like, I chose Ethan's face because blah, blah, blah. So they start justifying their choice rather than even thinking uh, what, what, what choices that they're making. And this is used a lot in crime psychology, in memory bias. So there's a TED talk by Elizabeth Loftus about, uh, is your memory reliable? Uh, so let me ask you a question. Uh, uh, you'll have to answer quickly, okay? So, how many animals does Moses take on the ark? How many animals did Moses take on the ark? A lot. I don't know, a thousand, okay. Uh, Khadiza, you're typing something. Good catch. So this is something which is called uh, Moses illusion. So it was not actually Moses who took the animals on the ark. It was Noah. But when you pose the question like how many animals did Moses take on the ark? Often uh, when you're not in like this kind of a classroom setup, when you're already primed to find issues, often the answer you get is uh, two. It's a scientific study uh, that I don't remember the percentages, but it's a really high percentage of people who say two or give them a number. And what you're doing is you're shifting attention instead of asking uh, like uh, you're shifting attention to the arc. So, for example, in, in crime situations, etc., you can say like, uh, hey, that that red car you saw, did it move? Uh, was it going towards right or was it going towards the left? And even if uh, the person who is doing, who is who is giving evidence, did not see a car. Will not now not say I didn't see a car. They'll be like, oh, the red car. I don't remember which direction did it take. Because there's no red red car to begin with. But now you've planted a red car in the memory. But they can't say which direction. But they cannot anymore say that there was no car. Now next time when they come, the 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 memory has already taken that there was a red car so next time they come so which which direction did was it uh, was it left or was it right and then you'll get some kind of answer so you then establish that there was a car so this is the power of deception but in games we don't want to cheat people okay we want to be tongue in cheek about it like magicians are they tell you it's a magic trick and then they do it for example i could have told ethan no matter what you do you're going to get the brushes and then no matter what he did, he would have gotten the brushes and that would have been a more effective magic trick. So the other, uh, I'll tell you a few more, you know, uh, mind tricks that magicians use and game designers can use. So one of the one of the important things about identical choice is that there was a segment in QI about this. They did a study where they asked people about their childhoods and convinced people that they committed crimes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is actually uh, part of that TED talk that I'm talking about as well. 
So yeah, uh, one of the ways of how can you use this power of suggestion in identical choice? So simply having cards and all of them being the same might not work. Uh, you have the, the player has to really believe that things behind it are different. Right, so you can use boxes or doors or whatever, but imagine that a different animation is going into each of these boxes, right? Uh, a pink animation, a blue animation, and a green animation, but the boxes are identical. So the the player starts thinking that different things are entering the box, so different things will come out of the box. So no matter which box they choose, you can still give them the reward, like a teddy bear that you were planning to. But in their head, there were different choices. Similarly with doors, you can have the same room behind three doors, but if the doors are de designed differently, they have different stickers or paintings looking adult, looking childish, you're creating this illusion that they're different things. Replayability could be a problem in this, but that is something that you can play around with. That Where can you use it and where can you not? Maybe reward screens, you can use it. So let's quickly look at stereotypical choice patterns. So stereotypical typical choice patterns is basically human tendency of stereotypically choosing certain things uh, given an open choice. For example, if you have four things lined up, uh, like four cards or four things on a desk, a deck or four choices, if you're right-handed, the chances of you choosing the one which is third from left is 65%. So as a game designer, you can put four choices, but what you'll realize is that a lot of people are choosing one of those choices. Uh, Pokemon Go had this problem. Uh, other games have had this problem. Like people are biasing towards something and you don't know why, but these are inherent biases that we have. So as designers, if we know that inherent bias, we can either design for that or be aware of it. Like you're making all the narrative branches and if you're putting the choices in a way that uh, you know, people are still choosing one of them. It, it it puts all your effort in all of those branches, actually nullifies it. The other uh, stereotypical choice patterns are in a, in a room full of people. If you'll ask, pick a number or pick a card, the chances of people picking seven, three, picking ace and queen is extremely high, right? Uh, so as game designers, knowing these things about human mind actually really helps in you either negating the bias or using it for the advantage of the game. Another thing is, which is very interesting for uh, UX and UI design of a game, is that if it if there's a dinner table and you've put different dishes in different areas, the way a dinner table is laid out has a huge impact on what the people are going to eat. You know, uh, if we remove the idea of allergies and stuff, if everybody is, say, vegetarian in the room, and uh, there are things on the table, the way the table is laid has a huge impact on what people are going to eat. So imagine your UI design, your UX design. You might be just putting things in three by five uh, or tiles and stuff, but you're not really thinking uh, about how we are navigating a space. Supermarkets do this a lot, right? Based on your space navigation, more things sell. So they put the right things in the right place according to them for marketing. This is uh, uh, visual saliency. It's one of my favorite ones. In in visual saliency, what happens? Let me. I don't have a pack of cards here, but what I have is this book. So have you seen uh, Now You See Me? The the movie Now You See Me has any have any of you seen it? Do you remember the opening scene? You know where the lead actor goes like. Yeah, so what happens is that you this is called riffle force, right? So you, if you have a pack of cards, the magician is going to do a riffle and say pick a card, any card. But the, what they're going to do is they're going to make one of the cards stay longer compared to the others. Not too long because that would be suspicious, but just about right. So when you say pick a card, any card, you'll the chances of people picking that card, which was salient, is about 95 to 98%. That is how much the power of suggestion works. And this is studied. Uh, if you want to look at the paper, it's by Olson. So it is 
in games, for example, you can use the saliency in multiple ways. For example, if you, it's a gacha game or some other kind of uh, collectible card kind of game, you have all of this UI, but you want players to choose a particular choice. You can make that choice slightly bigger, like the one that you see in the middle over here. So when there's a carousal, the chances of people picking that might be higher based on this logic. And what if you repeat the choice that you want people to pick? Because you've designed the experience in that way. The chances of people going for that choice is higher. Imagine a racing game. You have a racing game and you have like two turns and say there's a billboard on one side and really flashy one. You're basically suggesting that is a more interesting choice. So this is all uh, part of how saliency is effective and is used. Lastly, this is the very last one. I will, I'm going to talk a bit more about Equivoke. So Equivoke is the trick that we did in the beginning. The, uh, the one with the brushes uh, where Ethan got the brushes uh, based on the choices that he made. So for example, in this case, the magician will say, touch two of the items, right? And the magician has already decided that no matter what you touch, you'll get the pie, uh, the strawberry pie. Uh, it's a tart, isn't it? Raspberry tart. Uh, and then you go like, touch any two of them. And say you touch the coffee and the cake, but uh, the magician wanted you to have the pie. So they'll remove the coffee and the cake and you will have the pie. Whereas if you touched the pie and the coffee, uh, the magician will keep that and remove the cake and then will go touch one of them. And say you touch the pie, you'll get the pie. If you touch the coffee, they'll take the coffee away and you'll get the pie. So is that clear to everybody how that works? Yeah. So uh, what is interesting about Equivoke is that you genuinely have a free choice, right? Your choice is not being forced. For example, in the Riffle Force, your choice itself is forced. So players can have a free choice. And what I did is that I did a study with a game. It's called Osaka. And uh, in this game, you basically have just a linear story. And every choice is a fake choice or an Equivoke. And what I studied is that whether people feel that a freedom of choice and whether they feel that the choice had an impact on the outcome because that's the main thing over here right and whether they felt you know decision uncertainty like should i do this should i do that so they were weighing their options or not so in this game what happens is that you are a person who's uh, gone to visit osaka to your friend and your friend kind of abandoned you she did not show up and now you're in a dingy hotel and uh, she finally shows up after two days uh, for dinner and you're, you're hearing a lot of noises and you ask her, like you guys are talking, like you both are talking and then you hear a lot of noises and then you ask her um, what is happening and she understands the noises because of the language, but you don't. And she doesn't really tell you, but she makes faces as if she's hurried and stuff. And then you're like, and then she's like, we, we need to get out of here. And then you're like, what is happening? And then she goes like, gosh, we need to hurry which way and no matter which way you choose you go through the front door and what i found that uh this was effective for players even when the 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 trick was repeated over four times uh in my study so so far we've been looking at branching in a different way uh but right now uh, this is an, another way of looking at branching so do you have uh, any questions about Equivoke or any of these tricks or any any more ideas on these concepts? Or anything else you want to talk about in terms of UEL games and uh, what we teach here? So uh, in choose your own adventure style games, what you're actually doing is you actually give them a branch which comes back. So it's called branch and bottleneck. Uh, so it's not that no matter what you choose, you'll still go to the same page number or you'll go to the same branch. What happens is that you, you are given a different branches and then it converges. So you also see that in Walking Dead games. Whereas what this is, 
is that the choice is phrased in a way that anything can happen and you don't see this used a lot in games uh, so far because we are quite scared of whether the trick will be seen or not. So there's a slight difference over there between converging and uh, this is completely linear. There is no choice at all, but yeah. So this is an example course that I would uh, uh, teach, for example, in the first year or even in the second year, just to get more ideas of how to apply things from architecture, things from magic into your game design to like, you know, to really think differently and to start seeing the potential that other fields have. For example, if I teach poet, uh, how poetry is used in game design, then we're talking about apl application of metaphor, problem solving with riddles. So that is a uh, kind of allowing uh, students to think in different ways for your game design problems. And we also work with things which are unorthodox tools. So you can make games using uh, not necessarily. So we obviously teach Unity and Unreal and all the coding that you need. And uh, but we also allow uh, or have modules where you have the ability to design game in PowerPoint if you want or Instagram or use any of the tools available as long as you make an engaging interactive experience where you are able to tell a story or or uh, able to express your uh, message and something like equivoke for example it's not necessarily necessarily just for narrative games so if you think about resources right so imagine there's a game i think i think undertale does it a bit imagine there's a game and you're collecting a resource called uh, called chaos or karma so as a player, you don't know what karma could be. It could be bad karma, it could be good karma, it could be neutral karma. And as a designer, you have the ability to uh, put any definition of it at any point, right? Uh, and that is an equivoke. Similarly, in platformers, there could be uh, certain uh, objects or say a hole in the platformer. And while you have set up the pattern that the hole is something where you die, you can change the look of the hole a bit and now you have the choice uh, of uh, you know changing that interpretation of it on the go. So I think the way Undertale does it is that you have EXP, and your expectation as a player is that gaining experience will do something. I forgot uh, what the game is really doing, but the idea of it is that they change the interpretation, and you're shocked by what is happening. Stanley Parable has a bit of a diff similar mindset but it doesn't quite use equivoke so there's a lot of ways to you know use uh, magic in quite quirky and interesting ways to surprise the players without you know uh, having the intention to actually deceive them and that's what i like about magic that when i'm sitting in a magic trick with pen and teller doing their thing i'm not necessarily you know uh, getting fooled and being upset about being fooled because I know it's within the universe of a magic trick. And I I really tell designers to think more about being open and transparent about it and just having a bit of fun with it. Um, and that is also to reduce the entry barrier to these kind of fields, you know, game design, game development. Uh, it allows you to come from different angles and create a more inclusive environment that more people can join who are from different fields. and and see that how we overlap and can work together. So that is some of the things that uh, we really care about, about um, different thinking, inclusivity in, in practice, in design and development. So hope that is something that uh, uh, you find interesting and exciting. Any questions about UEL or anything uh, on those lines?
Yeah, that's interesting. So um, I suggest, you know, uh, trying this game out. It's called Safarosa. Um, you'll have to like follow them on Instagram to play that game. But basically, it's a it's a it's a mystery solving choose your own adventure kind of game. I can't show it because it's not a public game. And uh, you have like different videos, and they give you a map. So you start with one episode, and then you enter different. Uh, routes within Instagram and there are different profiles to solve the mystery. Uh, oh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second just to, you know, pull something up. And that might be interesting for you. Okay, wow. My computer has found the right time to be a bit naughty. So for example, this is one of my games, just a game jam games. So it's nothing super exciting, but let's just take a look. So here, like as a player, you have to go and solve this mystery. You have to add this password. And what you do, this is basically an, uh, an abandoned account of a wannabe writer. And what you have to do is you have to go through their files to figure out what is it that they were up to. So um, let's see, this is some of the stuff that they wrote, for example. And then when you go here, you find more information and you're solving little puzzles. And then you hit this. It says error. You're like, why is there an error? And you see different files. Maybe you download some of them. And then you have all of these hints which lead to different places, which tell you more and more about so it's basically the more you read it, the more you'll understand what uh, about the uh, this artist, and you're basically going through their world to solve the idea of what the password is. And as you go, you get more and more hints about it. So you basically are working through certain ideas that they were going through and you find out what's happening in their lives. So the Instagram game is similar to this kind of a game that you're working through over here. It's mostly like what I showed is uh, images, etc., and text and some videos. But uh, in the Instagram game, there is a lot of movie. So um, you can play this game if you like. Uh, it's in the end, the final form when you unlock, like you there's also some more interactive bits where you have to answer questions. Uh, and based on your answers, you get some feedback. So in the end, when you unlock your uh, password, you will be able to tell us a story about this writer. So as a designer, I have quite a few letters of what people think that this writer was up to, which is quite interesting. And then I'll send you an email saying whether you got it or you didn't get it and stuff like that. So. Uh, this is basically uh, a game made in uh, Google Office Suite using Excel and forms and PDFs and um, all kind of slideshows, I think. Like you get a rejection letter, some poems, so you start understanding what's happening with them. And there is, I don't want to spoil the game, but you'll find what is really going on. Uh, and you will find the password if you play it uh, for around half an, one one hour, one hour or one and a half hours. So this is an example of uh, something. Some of my students have made games which are just performance art. So like uh, they have YouTube videos where th there's just voice, and then you have to find out. Uh, it's a choose your own adventure style game in that sense. But there are some people who've made games. Um, using fading effects to see how memory loss works and stuff like that. And they're not really made in uh, classical game engines, but you can do that in PowerPoint or, or these kind of, uh, you know, tools. So this is more like enabling a, a people to do design in different ways. 
and just opening your mind like really you don't have to use these tools but uh, when that is the right thing to use why not right yeah 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 absolutely me too me too i really enjoy those yeah yeah i've played mari's room i really like that game i actually uh, was presenting at game happens which is an indie game development uh, conference and they were presenting their game and i got to see that game and i was like wow that's amazing so for the people who don't know mari's room is like a point and click adventure in one room and then you have to figure uh, what has happened so you find clues it's it's very well done yeah so any more questions because i am uh done selling magic to you and uh, here i just wanted to end with a quote of uh, arthur c clark that uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is not too far from magic so uh, games in, is an interesting intersection of that um you know like uh, darren brown does um uh, does this in one of the parks in london it's called ghost train and over there you're wearing a vr headset and uh, you get into a train where really horrifying things happen and the reason it really works is that what happens when you wear vr is that you might lose the immersion right but in this case what is happening is he is dressed the vr headset as a gas mask so it adds to the immersion rather than removing from it and you're actually going into the into the train and i've heard it's pretty horrifying i i, I didn't do it but um, i think that is where these illusions and technology when they come together they can create quite engaging uh... yeah 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 you should look it up it's it's one of the, in one of the parks i forget forget which one and uh, one person i know who did it was like really horrified they were like <laughs> they did not recommend it um and there is uh, this game where you have the character psychomantis i think and basically the character itself is mind reading you but they're doing it by uh, your player data but at that point uh, players were not expecting that to happen i i forget which game does it and that is another way of using magic uh in games like uh, interpreting data and uh, kind of predicting the fortune uh, of the player but based on actual uh, artificial intelligence and uh, when that comes true then it's quite shocking so i hope this was interesting for you like it's a very interesting topic for me yeah possibly thank you then for all the information here for everybody else as well <laughs> yeah. So do you have any feedback was this interesting uh would this be something that you would uh, you you think about and you know is is it exciting to think about the stuff that is good thank you kaliza Thank you then. I 
I suggest reading Raph Costa's theory of fun, especially the part where you have the pattern recognition thing. Thank you, Joy. Yeah, I was saying that a suggested reading would be uh, Raf Costa's theory of fun when it comes to patterns. Um, and there's Kostikian on uncertainty in games, uh, talking about surprise and uncertainty, which is quite interesting. So you could have these small reads and, you know, uh, get more information on this kind of stuff on how to create surprise and uncertainty and problems in games. So thank you very much. I'm very glad that uh, you all came here. Um, and I had a very nice session with you all. And I hope you had you had to you too had a good session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.